Hyperinflation, as the most popular economics channel on YouTube calls it, is game over for any economy. Therefore, if this massive channel makes the case that the US dollar has secretly declined in value and that the country is plausibly on the brink of hyperinflation, we should assume that his bold claims are grounded in economic theory and supported by data. Or at least not directly contradicted by publicly available data, right? Hey, I'm Yuri, a research economist at the universities of Groningen and Cape Town. And in this video, I'm going to respond to hyperinflation is already here. You just haven't realized it yet by Economics Explained or EE for short. All right, EE starts the video with a super engaging introduction, stating that the economic situation that set the scene for hyperinflation in countries like Weimar, Germany and Zimbabwe are in fact comparable to those today in the United States. Then he poses three central questions. When does inflation actually start to become an unsolvable problem in the economy? Weirdly enough, EE doesn't really answer this question in this video. So I guess I'll have to do that for him. But he does imply that hyperinflation would be right around the corner in any normal country because asset prices have been going up like crazy. Why do people think the USA is immune from the same consequences as all of these other examples? Here EE suggests that people think that the USA is immune from this because the dollar is the global reserve currency but that we should be careful about how long this will protect the USA from hyperinflation. What is the best way for people to protect themselves against this kind of worst case scenario? Finally here, EE not only advises us to invest in properties and stocks, but to do so using borrowed money. After all, that money won't be worth anything anymore soon anyway. And you know what? All of this sounds very logical, but does it hold up to scrutiny if we dive a little deeper? Okay, right off the bat, I have to say this introduction is really well made, very engaging to the point that I almost forgot to write down the logic of it all. But basically, EE mentions four points about Weimar Germany. And of onerous war reparations demanded from them by the victors of World War I. This, combined with domestic stimulus efforts to rebuild a post-war nation, combined with hits to productive capacity, like the French occupation of the nation's most powerful industrial centres, gave the government little option but to print more money in an attempt to get their economy working in any capacity. However, when EE summarises it, this reckless printing, combined with equally reckless borrowing and the reduction in productive capacity of the nation, saw the value of the German papier mark tanked. He doesn't mention these capital outflows as a consequence of the war reparations anymore. Hmm, strange. But since capital outflows due to reparations were an essential part of the Weimar story according to both EE and my own sources, I decided to keep them on the list anyway. Next I did some research on how to fit EE's points into well-known economic theory frameworks. The argument of massive capital outflows is related to what economists call the exchange rate channel of inflation, meaning that if there are large outflows of money, the currency of a country loses value and as a consequence imported products will become much more expensive. This is for a large part what is happening in Lebanon today, which is actually experiencing monthly inflation rates of over 50%. And as EE tells us in his follow-up video, the last three points in this video are based on the quantity theory of money that states that the money supply times money velocity equals the products sold in an economy times the prices of those products. For example, if in an economy there were two dollars and these exchange hands once and there were two loaves of bread in the economy, then we can deduce that the price of each bread was one dollar. Now in itself, this equation only tells us that there will be a relationship between these variables. But crucially, it doesn't tell us what that relationship will be. For example, you could argue that if we assume that the money velocity remains equal and so does production, an increase in money supply will then logically lead to an increase in prices. Say that there are now twice as many dollars and they still change hands only once. The number of bread loaves is also the same then we can deduce that the price must have increased to $2 per loaf. After all, if bread production doesn't change and the number of transactions don't change, but money does, it is likely that prices will increase thanks to the extra demand for bread that this new money brings. But when expecting economic theories, you should always pay attention to the assumptions that are being made. Why should this new money not be saved rather than spent, reducing the velocity of money, or why should we assume that this new money has not been used to spur an unemployed baker into action? So in itself, an increase in the money supply doesn't have to mean an increase in prices, 
and the drop in productive capacity itself also doesn't have to mean that there will be inflation. But as EE rightly notes, an increase in the money supply and the drop in production could very well mean that inflation will pick up. So what happens if we take this simple bit of economic theory to EE's list? Well, we see that printing and stimulus are money up arguments, while the productive capacity argument is a production down argument. So while typical economists would structure these a little bit differently, EE's arguments are rooted in basic economic theory. Let's move on to the next point. Hungary, 1945. Over half of the nation's factories and businesses had been destroyed. The government had no choice but to direct more and more money through private banks to issue loans to businesses to rebuild from the ground up. This saw the value of the Hungarian Pengo tank Yugoslavia, 1992. Industrial capacity is reduced and this slowdown of output is accelerated by a trade embargo placed on the country by the United Nations. To combat this, the government turned on the money printers and made borrowing a lot easier. Zimbabwe, 2007. Mass exodus of capital from the nation, driving down the exchange rate of their dollar. This made importing farming supplies very expensive, which in turn crippled the output of the nation. This, combined with the now infamous Land Reform Act, gave the government little options but to try and print their way out of trouble to no avail. Okay, here again, sanctions, massive outflows of capital, keep that in mind. North Korea, 2009. Farming output was hit by sanctions and a poor year for weather. Money printing, hyperinflation. Venezuela, 2016. The international sanctions gave the government no choice but to print money in an attempt to maintain generous living standards. This reckless money creation, combined with the massive reduction in output, hyperinflation. Okay, with that in mind, let's move on to America 2020. The fallout of the coronavirus has hit the nation particularly hard. The pandemic has had an undeniable impact on the economy. Tourism, hospitality, in-person retail and entertainment, these sorts of industries are not going to be back at full capacity for a very long time. Okay, again, this sounds logical, right? But does it hold up if we dig a little deeper? Is there a difference between shutting down certain sectors of an economy during a pandemic and losing your industry to a foreign invader? Uh, yes, there are at least two. In the historical hyperinflation episodes, it was only supply that fell, but not demand. In other words, cruise ships are empty now, but that's also because people now don't want to go on a cruise ship. On the other hand, French troops taking German industry by force did not coincide with a drop in demand for these products. Of course, these differences have massive implications for inflation because it means that yes, production falls, but velocity also takes a massive hit. So overall prices don't have to rise. The second point is that if your productive sector gets occupied, taken away to a foreign country or is forcefully evicted from their lands, it wouldn't easily bounce back. On the other hand, during the pandemic, your production also takes a hit, but your productive capacity is still there. Okay, so here EE's theory is not complete, but what about the data? To find out if my arguments hold up better than those of EE, I did some research and looked up data on production in the USA and indeed, I found this graph which shows that when EE published his video, it was already clear that the US economy was producing roughly as much as it did before COVID. However, there's more to EE's argument that could lead to hyperinflation in the US because according to him, the US has printed more than a third of the active money supply in the economy today within the last 12 months. Hold on, hold on. When I saw this graph, several alarm bells started ringing in my head. While I also noticed other YouTubers like Jake Tran using it to make the same point, suspiciously no other media picked it up. Now that is very strange, huh? Well, it turns out that the reason is that this graph, while from a credible source and technically correct, doesn't show you what EE tells you that it shows you. To understand why, there is something that we have to understand about money. In the last century, inspired by the quantity theory of money, economists started to measure money. However, when they did so, they quickly ran into a problem. What counts as money? With the quantity theory in mind, the obvious answer is anything that can be used to purchase goods and services. So they started with banknotes and coins and categorized these as M0. But with bank money dominating our modern economies, they added both checking and saving accounts to M0 to get a measure known as M1. This is what has risen by over a third. However, many banks also have savings accounts that are fixed for a couple of months or weeks. And since many of these funds become available each day and most people don't spend their savings account anyway, aren't these very comparable to normal savings accounts? Now, this is why M2 contains all money 
any instruments in M1, plus savings accounts with specified dates. But then, you guessed it, it gets even more complicated. What about money in accounts at financial institutions that are technically not banks, but are very similar to banks? Well, these are included in M3. This distinction is important if we want to understand exactly why EE's graph is so misleading. Yes, in the USA, M1 seems to have exploded. But when I try to dig a little deeper by going to the source, I noticed that the last area of the graph was shaded, indicating that I should read the footnote. And this revealed to me that what happened here is that because of a change in regulations, many people shifted from fixed term savings accounts counted in M2 into M1 saving account balances. That's not money printing, is it? So then I decided to check M2 and indeed that did rise, but not by more than a third of the active money supply in the economy today. But even though EE's graph overstates money printing by a lot, there has arguably still been an increase in the money supply due to increased government spending. So what about our last factor, large capital outflows that will cause the exchange rate to plunge? Well, while capital flows are notoriously difficult to measure, one measure that is commonly used is net incurrences of portfolio investment liabilities from the IMF balance of payment dataset. And as you can see, nope. After the initial shock in the first quarter of 2020, private investors were rushing to get money into the USA and not out of it. So then if EE says, if this set of circumstances sounds familiar. My response would be no, not really, because while the USA has seen an increase in the money supply, it's not by as much as you made it out to be, and while it did also see a fall in production, its productive capacity is still largely intact. Furthermore, because of the pandemic, demand for luxury cruises and air travel has fallen along with supply, and finally there was no capital flight. But limited money printing and stimulus could still lead to hyperinflation down the road, right? And EE's other questions are still very interesting. So so let's see if they hold up any better. Take a look at this graph of consumer prices in Lebanon. You see how inflation was fairly mild for a long time, then accelerated and then exploded to hyperinflation levels. So this question is clearly very relevant, but the problem is that EE never answers it in his video. Instead, he seems to ask a question whether the dollar has secretly declined in value because the stock market has gone up, even though it's fundamental underlying value has clearly declined. In other words, since the beginning of 2020, this index, which is made up of the 500 largest companies in America, has undoubtedly become less good. Here there are two very interesting questions that need a little bit more exploration. Did the stock market index indeed undoubtedly become less good? And does an increase in asset prices secretly indicate a reduction in the value of the dollar? First, let's explore EE's claim that the underlying value of the S&P 500 index, which contains America's largest 500 companies, has indeed decreased in value. Sure, there are a few companies that have benefited from working from home or delivering products to combat the pandemic, but most companies are struggling. Global supply chains have been slowed, people are moving about less, therefore burning less fuel, and this is all to say nothing of companies directly involved in tourism or hospitality, which are now basically on government life support. Again, this sounds logical, but did EE actually do his research? Or is he just saying stuff? In other words, if we dig a little deeper, is it true that America's top 500 companies have become less good due to the pandemic? To find out, I looked up data on the earnings of these companies and sure, while tourist industry earnings are down and therefore undoubtedly less good, I discovered that the earnings of the 500 biggest companies in general were almost back up to their pre-COVID levels along with their stock prices, as can be seen in EE's own graph. So his argument that this index has without a doubt become less good is just not supported by the data. Desperately trying to prove that EE isn't just making stuff up, I decided to stretch his example a little bit and extend it to house prices. Look, it's undeniable that these went up like crazy during the pandemic, even though the economy has taken a hit. And that is really concerning. But house prices are not part of the consumer price index, CPI, 
and therefore are not directly contributing to inflation. However, then EE says, Only the value of these items is highly correlated in the short to medium term with these other assets. And again, technically this is correct. When I did my calculations, I found that in the USA, the CPI does indeed correlate with housing prices, but that is because they are both equally affected by inflation. However, EE then goes on to give the example that if real estate becomes more expensive, then rent is going to cost more, which means businesses are going to have to charge more to remain competitive and those additional charges will be registered as increased prices in the consumer price index. Implying that asset price booms typically cause inflation. In other words, he is implying that given that house prices look like this, consumer good prices look like this. But if we plot actual consumer prices, they look like this. Also doing a bit more research, I found that economic studies could never really find this link that EE is talking about. To the contrary, research typically found that asset price booms are followed by deflation. For example, the massive bubbles of the roaring 20s ended in the biggest deflationary episode America has ever seen. And Japan's massive asset price boom of the 80s ended in 30 years of deflation. And if that wasn't bad enough, if the dollar truly has become less good overall, there's actually a simple way to check that by using exchange rates. After all, in all of EE's hyperinflation examples, the exchange rate tanked as inflation was rising. On the other hand, the value of the dollar, if we compare it to a basket of international currencies, looks like this. So if we are super generous to EE, maybe the dollar has devalued a little bit, but not by a shocking amount compared to its history. So here again, to state that the massive rise in asset prices either reflects a massive devaluation of the dollar or will soon be translated to consumer price inflation are just empty claims that are contradicted by economic research. By the way, I've linked all of my data sources in the description of this video. So if you're afraid that I'm cherry picking my examples to make EE look bad, have a look there. And if you have better evidence than I presented here, let me know in the comments and I will feature the best critiques of my work there with a reference to the commenter. But at this point you might ask, so when does inflation become an unsolvable problem? Well, since EE doesn't really answer that question, let me have a go at it by looking at the example of Lebanon. Why did inflation suddenly turn to hyperinflation there? Well, there the big problem was that Lebanon was consistently importing more than it was exporting and money was therefore flowing out of the country. Now Lebanon could sustain the this trend for a long time because it had a big financial sector. But when outsiders lost trust in these banks, its currency started dropping, inflation became more pronounced, leading to an uncontrollable negative feedback loop and to unstoppable hyperinflation. And hey, as most of you know, the USA is consistently importing more than it exports, but yet it is receiving the money to do so thanks to its dominant financial sector. And this would have been a good bridge to EE's next section. In other words, what makes the USA different from Lebanon? Its currency status as the world reserve. And why is that important? Well, because this means that there is much more demand for US dollars than just the demand for American products. Or very unconventionally said, The value of American money depends on the productive capacity of the planet, more so than the productive capacity of the states. This does genuinely give American dollars some resistance to depreciation, but it's not limitless. And it also doesn't protect the United States from a situation where the entire global economy is impacted. Like let's say a global pandemic. Here it sounds to me like EE is implying that the global production capacity has been reduced thanks to the pandemic. Again, this claim can easily be verified by looking at production numbers in the two main industrial centers of the world, Europe and China. And the outcome of that is, nope, after a big dip, production was already back above its pre-pandemic level when EE released his video. But even though global production capacity didn't drop and therefore won't cause hyperinflation in the USA, let's entertain the following scenario. What if China and Europe get their currency game together and start offering a global currency? Or that one of the cryptocurrencies starts seriously challenging the dollar? If that happens, and the US political system is still in gridlock, this could potentially be what triggers hyperinflation in the USA. So in that case, you might still want to know the answer to EE's last question. How do you prepare for this? 
Okay, I'm going to keep this one short for you. EE proposes that... The traditional answer to this would be to hold real assets, like precious metals, productive real estate, or even stocks in companies. And then comes up with a unique solution that I really have never heard of before. Shorting currency, which basically means borrowing a currency and using it to buy real estate or stocks. Uh, I actually think this is very creative of EE. What he's saying is really not that different from the traditional solution. He's just saying that you should borrow money to do it better. Also, when EE proposes that... Imagine this. You were shopping for a new home in Germany in 1920. A lovely flat in Berlin would likely run you about 10,000 papier marks. Pretty expensive back then, but whatever. The nation was on the up and up under the control of the new Weimar Republic. So you put down a deposit of 2,000 papier marks and borrow the remaining 8,000 with a fixed rate mortgage. Fast forward two years and hyperinflation has gripped the nation. This is obviously causing all kinds of issues for day-to-day -day life, but it presents you with an interesting opportunity. You pick up a single marble off your desk and sell it to a child playing on the street for some of their pocket money. You then take your marble money to the bank and proceed to pay off your 30-year mortgage 2,000 times over. Yes, of course, hyperinflation will cause other issues that still impact your day-to-day -day life, but ultimately, you now have a place to live for the price of a marble. This is a very extreme and oversimplified example. Oof, this is more than an oversimplification. There are so many complicating factors that make it extremely likely that if you follow EE's example, you will crash and burn. For starters, banks and economies near hyperinflation charge extremely high interest rates, so you better have a stable monthly cash flow. However, in many cases, for example in Lebanon, asset markets collapse first and then you lose your job. So it's very likely that in the stock market your margin credit gets cold first and you'll sell at the loss. In the housing market, having no job means that you likely cannot afford to pay your monthly mortgage payments before hyperinflation really sets in. Also, you cannot pay off most mortgages before they are due and in the case of Weimar Germany, the constitutional court ordered that some remaining mortgages had to be partially revalued. In other words, you would still need to pay them off partially after hyperinflation. Finally, remember that hyperinflation is game over. So while looking out from your nice Berlin flat, you would likely have seen the following. And even if you just expect high but not hyperinflation, I found several research papers linked in the description that show that actually these traditional assets have a poorer track record than for example trend following hedge funds or some specific commodities. So then it's probably not very smart to get into debt for these investments. And if you fear the Lebanon scenario for hyperinflation in the USA, the best way to protect yourself is probably just to get yourself and your money out of the country just ask the Lebanese and Zimbabweans that have been lucky enough to have done that in time. So where does that leave EE's video on hyperinflation? Well, in short, there is a tail risk of hyperinflation, but that scenario will likely be similar to the Lebanon scenario, where consistent trade deficits and a loss of faith in the banking sector triggers an exchange rate collapse. On the other hand, there is no historical precedent for the scenario that EE is proposing, and as we have seen, it is barely grounded in economic theory and flat out contradicted by the data. That being said, if you are genuinely interested in why economists now fear the return of higher inflation all across the world, stay tuned for one of my next videos. And if you enjoyed this style of research-backed video, consider checking out my other response video or my video on the fall of the Lebanese currency. And finally, if you appreciate the research, consider supporting me on Patreon or buying me a coffee using the links in the description.